You should get the hell out of here. The shame is on you. You have no self-control. You are breaking the law right now. Debate over a tough border proposal turned into chaos at the state capitol. Will it do the same to Arizona's economy? The leader of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce weighs in. The state's former top cop wants your vote for Sheriff of Maricopa County. Does he deserve it? We speak with him. Hello? And Donald Trump's former lawyer calls into court to plead not guilty in the fake elector case. Now on Politics Unplugged. Good evening, I'm political editor Dennis Welch. This is Politics Unplugged. And Republicans in the state legislature took a big step this week toward putting an immigration enforcement measure on the November ballot. Governor Hobbs warns it, if it passes, businesses will leave Arizona. What does the business community actually think about HCR 2060? Joining me now is Danny Seiden, the president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you very much for joining us here today. And I've heard that you, you've been quoted as saying you've got some issues with this bill. Um, you've also said that this is a federal issue that Congress needs to deal with. The question for you then, if you think Congress needs to deal with this, they have shown over and over again that they're not willing to deal with this. So why should Arizona wait for Congress to act? Well, well Dennis, thanks for having me on and you're correct. I mean, the only reason we're having this conversation is the federal government has failed in mm -hmm. their job of protecting our borders and securing our borders. So that's why we're having this discussion. It's only reasonable that a state legislature will look to do something where the federal government has failed. And we saw it in Texas, right? SB4 was kind of the precursor to this mm -hmm. and is in a lot of ways tied to this measure. But let's let's talk about the measure. Why does it matter so much? Why, why in Arizona are we focused on this right now? It could be that illegal immigration is the number one issue in almost every single district, every poll we see. And the number two issue isn't even close anymore. So I think these members are trying to address a problem that should have been addressed by the federal government. And, and why is it the number one issue? You look at what's coming across the border. Look at fentanyl. Fentanyl right now, in, in, you know, today in Maricopa County, three people will die from mm -hmm. fentanyl. You know, uh, County Attorney Rachel Mitchell has said that the majority of the country's fentanyl is coming in through Arizona. So these are, are it's A lot of the fentanyl is coming through the ports of entry and is being carried by Americans from across Across the border a lot of that that's a lot a lot of it's coming across a, a lot of it's being interdicted that's coming over illegally as okay. well and um, I, I, again you know, we're not stopping enough of it, and it's a real problem. That has its own cost. Uh, the Common Sense Institute has estimated, this was 2022, that fentanyl has hurt the state of Arizona to the tune of $53 billion mm -hmm. in cost. So that's that's expensive as well. So that's why we're talking about this. That's why we're here. Now, again, uh, now that we've talked about why, let's talk about the what. The what is this bill, and the process mm -hmm. has gone into it. It's a, it's a referral, right? And that needs to be it's said. It's a referral, and yeah. what it does is it empowers local law enforcement to enforce federal immigration right. laws because it makes it a state crime to come here illegally or enter Arizona yeah. illegally. Um, there's been some issues raised about how do you enforce this statewide. Yeah. Um, there were also some concerns that were amended on the floor about protections for uh, the deferred action or childhood arrivals, the dreamers, so-called dreamers. Um, but basically, in a nutshell, the big, the big, the big takeaway is in l allowing local force, uh, police to enforce federal immigration law. No, that, that's true. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Senator Ken Bennett deserves a lot of credit for removing those provisions mm -hmm. addressed to the DACA. Those are children who were brought here. They followed the law. They've checked in. They've done everything. That's a population of over 24,000 in our state who are going to work and being valuable members of Arizona's uh, economy and of our citizenship. And, you know, it's important to note this, too. The voters have already addressed the DACA issue in Arizona. They wanted mm -hmm. to give them in-state tuition. Sure. So it, we, we see them as a valuable group. Um, what the bill does uh, that you mentioned, it does create this state crime. And that's a little bit concerning because it's going to the ballot. And now when something goes to the ballot, as you know, Dennis, voter protected. it's voter protected. So within the language, we are trapped forever. The, the legislature cannot go in there and address these things. They cannot modernize it when it needs to be modernized. So that's not the preferred method of legislating something like this. Now, Senator Shamp tried to do it legislatively. It didn't work out. So here we are with the ballot referral that has some potential bad consequences in terms of unfunded mandates on our law enforcement. I know you're going to have them on later, but Colonel Milstead and I, during the Ducey administration, when we was the head of the Border Strike Force, we went to Washington. DC. We fought and lobbied Congress to get our local law enforcement reimbursed for the work they're doing on the border now for housing immigrants in their jails. And you know what? We never got those amounts. The, the federal government is already behind on what they owe the state of Arizona. So this is going to be even more of a strain. So if this was to pass, uh, and, and it, look, if it, gets to, if it goes to the voters in November, it's got a pretty good chance of passing. I mean, it is one of the top issues 
in Arizona. Um, I haven't seen any specific polling on whether or not this specific proposal would pass. I mean, obviously there'd be campaigns and whatnot, so there's some big question marks still there. But if it were to pass, uh, what do you think would happen to Arizona's business climate, the economy here in Arizona? Because you were here, you're long enough, you remember what happened after 1070. I do, and, and again, it's worth pointing out, this is not 1070, this sure. is not 12 plus years ago. The, the world is different. Illegal immigration is the number one issue. We're seeing it, we're feeling it. And something else about this measure, Dennis, it's tied to Texas is SB4, mm -hmm. and it won't be effective until after the court has ruled on SB4. And I think there's going to be a lot of litigation around this. So that's mm -hmm. what's going to happen first. But, but secondly, I, I want to note a couple of things. I've seen a lot of the other business groups come out with these extreme statements of how this could destroy the economy and how it could hurt our workforce. My members, the members of the chamber, largest employers in the state, they're not hiring undocumented workers. They use E-Verify. They follow mm -hmm. the law. So that's not going to change for them. What it could do is it could allow for some reputational damage because these groups are piling it on right now. Oh, it's it's going to be 1070 over again, and the state's not going to be a welcome place. Everyone knows Arizona is a welcome place. We're an opportunity for all state, and that's the message we need to be hitting yeah. out. So we have a lot to wait and see on what happens. We have to see what the final language looks like. We have to see if the voters will respond to a campaign against this, and we have to see. But, but Arizona is still dealing with the after effects of 1070, and you can understand why people are very sensitive. Oh, Whether this is exactly like 1070 or not, I mean, you've got a Maricopa County Sheriff's Department still paying out hundreds of millions of dollars because of a racial profiling abuses in a prior sheriff's administration. Yeah. And Sheriff Joe isn't here anymore. The, sure. federal, the federal monitor stayed in through Sheriff Penzone. I think that's been a tough situation for Maricopa County to deal with. But again, um, the, 1070 isn't around, and we still have that federal mm -hmm. monitor. So you're right. There's a lot of training issues for law enforcement. There's a lot of how do we implement this. It, it should be noted, Dennis, the bill to get a little bit more narrow this week, the probable cause seems to be tied mainly to witnessing someone crossing the border mainly. illegally. There is some yeah. broad language there in there. There is some odd language, and that's why I think the courts are going to have a field day. This is going to be litigated for a very long time. But our economy is strong. Our workforce is diverse, mm -hmm. and I believe we will, we will get through this. We're not going to call for boycotts of our own state. We love Arizona. Yeah. We know better. And that's what's happening right now. I think we're rallying around rallying around the sense that we can protect ourselves, but at the same time, we can find a better policy than this. Yeah, and let's wrap up with this. I mean, obviously, uh, maybe people don't really appreciate or understand. You represent a coalition of businesses. I do. And yeah. you just can't come on here and, and, and give me your position on this without getting a majority of buy-in from the people you represent. Mm -hmm. So what are you hearing directly from the businesses that you're talking to? What are their concerns? No, thank you for pointing that. Yes, we represent uh, the largest business advocacy group in the state. So I meet with my members before we ever take a position. And there are concerns. Their concerns are they remember 1070. They don't love the opening ourselves up to reputational damage or attacks. They don't love accusations of trying to hire um, you know, illegal or undocumented workers, which they don't do. But they, um, they also don't love fentanyl. They also don't love watching their employees you know, suffer through this. Like I said, I mean, three people in Maricopa County are going to die today. So they understand the state is trying to address a failure of the federal government. But what my members want is for the right people to handle this, for the federal government to step in, to pass the legislation needed, and to get more legal immigration dance because we do need workers mm -hmm. we need legal workers and so we need to increase the flow of legal immigration all right we're gonna have to wrap it right there danny siding from the chamber of commerce thank you very much for stopping by here and still ahead the former head of dps now wants to be maricopa county sheriff i'll talk with frank milstead when politics unplugged continues And welcome back to Politics Unplugged. Frank Milstead has served as police chief in Mesa and is the head of DPS. Now he wants to be the sheriff of Maricopa County. He joins me now to talk about why he wants this job. I want to thank you for joining us here today. You've been you've served in Arizona law enforcement, I believe, for what, 35 years. You yes. retire back in 20. Why do you want to get back into this? Why not enjoy retirement? Well, you know, I looked at what was going on in the county. Remember, this is my hometown. I was born in Phoenix, went to Central High School. Uh, I started seeing all of the problems. I see what's happening on the West Coast with these uh, liberal politics and liberal county attorneys. And somebody's got to stand in the gap and somebody has to protect Arizona. Uh, and I'm the right guy for the job. I've been greeted with success everywhere that I've ever been in police leadership. Okay. And what's the, t the top issue? Why, what, what sets you above everybody else? You're running a Republican primary. You're not the only one. Uh, what sets you above uh, your opponents? And what's the top issue you want to tackle? So the difference is success. 
and experience. I'm the only one that's led two major police agencies. I'm the only one that uh, sat in the Rose Garden with President Trump when he announced his immigration policy. I sat in his cabinet room to help him figure out how that was going to look. I've negotiated at the highest levels in D.C. I've been negotiating with the state legislature. Uh, I can work with the federal monitor. I can work with the judge uh, and uh, relieve the pressures of having the court orders leaning on the department. Uh, it's, a, it's really a hand on the throat of the department. Okay, and let's talk a, talk a little bit. You heard me discuss uh, just the prior segment with the head of the Chamber of Commerce. We talked about this uh, immigration bill, uh, proposal that could go to the voters. Do you think this is good policy to have local law enforcement enforce federal immigration law? Because this could be something, if you're the next sheriff, you could have to deal with here in Maricopa County. Yeah, we'll see what happens with the with the law. But uh, my my point would be, yes, absolutely. Are we going to leave it up to the uh, border czar? Do you think Kamala Harris has done anything for Arizona, anything for immigration? Do you think Joe Biden has done anything for Arizona, anything for immigration? Mm -hmm. What I don't understand is their parents, they have people in their lives that are important to them, but they let people flow over the border and continue to, to cause, uh, you know, criminal issues, uh, overwhelm social services, overwhelm our hospitals. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I absolutely think think we need to do something about because the federal government has absolutely been pathetic and dropped the ball on the immigration issue. Sure. You said overwhelm hospitals and whatnot. It's an interesting word. Couldn't this overwhelm law enforcement? Um, because you're being asked to do even more at this time if you're asked to enforce this statewide. So I think if you look at the, the parameters of the law, it's a pretty narrow scope. And uh, I don't see it overwhelming us. But then again, Dennis, what choice do we have? We have to do something. Mm -hmm. We can't just sit here and let all of these people from, from all over the world. This isn't about people from Latin America, or from Mexico. These are people all over the world that now know that they can walk through the porous Arizona border and invade Arizona and the country. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, too, that, you know, the sheriff's department still reeling from the Arpaio administration, still dealing with a federal overseer. Um, and been paying out on that for, you know, they, they were found to be racial profiling back then. If this was to become law, what would be your advice to your deputies out there how to avoid uh, racial profiling, how to avoid getting into any trouble or going afoul of this law? Well, I think you've already seen the, the work of the women and men at the agency. The deputies are already providing that world-class service. Uh, and the reason that you don't have to worry about that at MCSO is we're already enjoined by the court order that does not allow us to do any immigration enforcement. So we won't do that. What we work on is criminality. Mm -hmm. As long as we focus on crime, state crimes, city crimes, uh, we are safe from any scrutiny because criminals need to go to jail. Criminals need to be held responsible for what they do, no matter where they're from or what walk of life. Okay, let's move on now. I got to ask you a couple of questions. I'm sure you're prepared for it, but the, you know, uh, you know, some incidents in the past. It's going to come up in the campaign, and I want to first start with uh, the issue back. I believe in uh, 2022 or whatnot. A uh, former partner of yours, a girlfriend, had gotten a restraining order against you and accused you of verbal and physical assault or abuse. What happened there, and where is that now? So that's all been resolved amicably. Uh, that was somebody that was very important in my life uh, for a very long mm -hmm. time. Uh, I would say that we probably both hang, uh, held on to a relationship a little bit too long. Sure. Um, and again, uh, there was uh, some things said, but I don't have any reason to disparage her. I only want the best for her in her life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think she feels the same way for me. So what happened? But what happened? I mean, a lot of people break up, but they don't end up with restraining orders and accusations like that. Can you tell us what happened and, 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 and how the relationship is with that person now? Yeah. So, again, it was resolved amicably. Uh, there's really nothing to discuss. I think she had received some bad advice from an attorney and wrote down things that uh, were inaccurate or were hyperbole. Uh, so it is what it is. Uh, I can't change that. It's, uh, it's, it would be something I think that you probably have to talk to her about. OK. And just be real clear, no abuse then from your part is what you're saying. Look, I, uh, I've been in law enforcement for 35 years. I've been in uh, a number of relationships. Nobody has ever accused me of excessive force or, or violence. Uh, no, my actually ex-wife wrote a letter uh, in, on my behalf saying that not only am I a loving and gentle man, uh, but I was one of the best partners that she ever had. Fair enough. And let's ask you about this question again. It's going to come up on the campaign trail. I'd just like to ask you about this right now. Back, I believe in uh, tw uh, 2019, you were pulled over doing 90 miles an hour in a 75 mile an hour zone. Correct. And there was some video there. You'd showed this uh, Yavapai County Sheriff's deputy uh, your badge. You got off with a warning. Um, do you think you were abusing your position as the head of DPS to get out of a ticket? 
No, I don't. In fact, um, I, I know it didn't film well, and I know it wasn't a, a good scenario. So what I did in turn is I made a sizable contribution uh, back to Make-A-Wish. Sure. Uh, Make-A-Wish is, uh, is a charity that's near and dear to my heart, having that it started at DPS when my dad was a DPS director. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go back and watch the video, it's a, it's a very back and forth conversation. Uh, and again, I don't think it filmed well, but uh, the idea that uh, I was not issued a citation, I wanted to make sure that I used money somewhere else. Okay, and, and I get that and, and whatnot, but most people get caught doing 90, you don't get off with a warning. I've never been given a warning by a sheriff's, uh, by, by a sheriff's deputy or a DPS trooper. You need to be nicer to the officer. I am. I'm very nice to the officer, but like, <laughs> people are, are going to wonder. Like, you know, it's it's a legitimate well, question. Well, it's 15 over, and Did I don't you... know if you drive on the 101 or the 202. If you drive uh, yeah. 15 over, you're going to get run over. But uh, that's just the way it is. Um, we were passing through cars, and I know it's it's sexy to think, wow, he's just driving 90 up I-17 and and doesn't care. Yeah, we had just moved through some cars, slower it's, traffic. It's it's the question of whether or not you showed him the DPS badge, or the, you let him know you were the chief. It's the question of whether you're using your position at the time to get treatment that most people wouldn't. So I don't think the deputy even knew who I was, and that's why I gave him my identification, because he actually went back to his car and mm -hmm. ran me for once and warrants and to make sure I had a valid driver's license. Uh, so it, it was just trying to explain what was going on. If you also recall, my fiancé at the time had, had said a lot of things to the deputy, and uh, I was just trying to clear that up because I think he was confused. All right, I want to thank you for stopping here and taking the hard questions. You're always welcome back here anytime. Frank Milstead, Maricopa County Sheriff's candidate. And up next, I'm bringing in our panel to talk about all of this week's major headlines, including including Rudy Giuliani's plea by phone in the fake electors case. That's next here on Politics Unplugged. Welcome to Politics Unplugged. There's a lot to go over this week, so let's bring in the panel. Republican consultant Chip Scutari and Democratic consultant Roy Herrera. And Roy, let's, you're the resident attorney here at the table. <laughs> uh, let's, <laughs> let's start with you. Let's start with you about what happened this week with the indictments coming down. The, the defendants in this fake elector case have been accused of plotting to overturn the elections, hand the victory to Donald Trump for the 2020 election, even though Joe Biden won here. They made their first appearance in court. Rudy Giuliani, the big uh, news of the day, calls in to plead not guilty. Um, and uh, actually, the prosecutors sought and got a $10,000 bond against him. Talk to us about what that means and, and, and why that's significant. Yeah, so as you mentioned, the defendants had their initial appearances in which they had the opportunity to plead guilty or not guilty. Unsurprisingly, they all pleaded not guilty. Rudy was an interesting one because he did ca call in. He failed to use his mute button at times and went to the restroom <laughs> yes, uh, during it. So there's a lot of things unusual about it. But I think the, the, the bond we're talking about here was caused by the fact that the prosecution had a very difficult time serving him mm -hmm. with uh, the indictment. And, and, you know, seemingly he doesn't seem very you know, mad about that or sad about that. Uh, and so therefore, you know, they asked for that. And yeah, he was actually taunting prosecutors going on to social media saying, if you can't find me, it also means you can't find votes. And then he tweeted out uh, something from an 80th birthday party where uh, the pro prosecutors from here from Arizona then <laughs> served him immediately yeah. after that. It's just kind of a crazy event. And, and Chip, let's get your take on this. Uh, I mean, is this more par for the course? Does this change anything now that these so-called fake electors are in court? Does this change anything politically moving forward? Well, first off, I think maybe Rudy, you know, America's uh, mayor at one point, he might have been overserved as 80th birthday party, <laughs> so he was struggling that day. But I think it will, you know, while these, you know, the fake electors will say it's not a big deal, they're, mm -hmm. they they pleaded not guilty, as Roy said. It is a big deal because now the rubber hits the road. Mm -hmm. There's real, going to be real court cases with real evidence. And from a, my perspective, I'm not an attorney like Roy, it looks like they have an abundance of evidence. And I heard through the grapevine that uh, Attorney General Chris Mays and her staff, they could have indicted more people, but they wanted to make sure to go after these 11 to get felony counts against them. So that while the, the court, uh, the lawsuit will play out for months and months, and we talked about this, it will be after this 2024 election. Um, it's going to be a big deal next year if these people, you know, get felony counts against them. Yeah, and again, it's a worth reminding everybody, innocent till proven yep. guilty. Um, talk to us a little bit as, again, the resident attorney here sure. at, the, at the saucer table. Uh, <laughs> talk to us a little bit about what they're going to have to prove here, because we know what happened. It's a question of proving intent at this point, correct? 
It is, and as Chip mentioned, I mean, this is going to play out over a fairly long period of time. I mean, yeah. there's no chance that any of these trials are going to go forward this year. It's probably going to be next year. I think, you know, again, to your point, in our justice system, everyone is innocent until proven guilty. This this next period of time, the defendants are going to get to see the evidence that the state has against them. I think there's certainly going to be conversations about maybe, you know, some folks pleading out and maybe flipping on other defendants. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of stuff that we're going to be discussing right now. I think in the short term, though, the political fallout, at least as I see it, is that will these criminal prosecutions result in some sort of deterrent effect? Because we do have a presidential election in November, mm -hmm. and to the extent that anyone else is thinking about doing this kind of fake elector thing, uh, they understand now, I think, that there could be criminal liability. All right, let's pivot now. Let's go over to the primaries now, where the knives are coming out of like, all these primaries, because it's getting late early in this election session, uh, season. We're about a month away or so, a little over yeah. a month away from early ballots dropping here in Arizona. And I want to show you a graphic right here. We had a former political pal, Republicans, uh, Abe Hamaday and Blake Masters used to be friends, but then uh, uh, we got a copy of these uh, text messages out there that uh, apparently Mr. Hamaday had sent to Blake Masters, where Ms. Mr. Hamaday had, cr had referred to people, election the so-called election deniers, as, quote, crazies. Um, wow, uh, Chip, you, you know, uh, what does this do for him in this Republican primary in the West, in the West Valley uh, when you, stuff like this is coming out where he's referring to election deniers as actual crazy? Well, I think it relates to our first topic of the fake electors. Uh -huh. We see through these texts that a lot of this is performative art. And Abe Hamaday is playing the voters for suckers, saying, mm -hmm. you know, he'll call them crazies on a private text, but then he'll talk about election denialism. Mm -hmm. He believes in the cons conspiracies. He spews it out. And it's interesting that the two cards carpetbaggers, Abe Hamaday, Blake Masters from Tucson, are really going at it tooth and nail. And it's getting ugly. Um, and I think this could open up a lane for Speaker Ben Toma or for Trent Franks even. Yeah, because yeah. these two guys are going to go at it. And I think, you know, it, the, the, the war chests are showing Abe Hamaday is struggling to raise money. Mm -hmm. His campaign's in a little bit of disarray. So this could really hurt. Now, I'm not forgiving Blake Masters for, you know, unveiling a private text. You do that if you're really friends with somebody, you keep texts private. But this is... I guess all is fair in love and war. Yeah, I think Abe Hamaday forgot the first rule in politics is you don't have any friends in <laughs> yeah, politics yeah, yeah. out there, right? I mean, yeah. I guess you do. Yeah. I mean, what, what, how do you see this shaking up out there? And there, so to be actually see this kind of evidence or see this kind of text message and exchange going on between Abe Hamaday and Blake Masters? Well, I think the first lesson, and you just referred to it, is you can't trust anybody in politics. I mean, we saw that with Carrie Lake, you know, leaking her I was conversations say, like, with yeah. Jeff DeWitt. Mm -hmm. And I mean, th these these kinds of things happen, so you got to be very careful what you say and what you text. But, you know, to Chip's point, I mean, I think this shows that he obviously, Abe Hamaday, has disdain for his own voters, uh, in private at least. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't surprise me. I mean, he calls them crazy because I think he knows, underlying it all, mm -hmm. that there is no basis for some of these election denial claims. Uh, but he can't say that, of course, publicly, but he will say it or indicate that to what he thinks is a friend. Okay, now let's kind of wrap this up and let's talk a little bit about that border referral that Republicans are trying to get to the ballot. Um, they're almost there. They got it through the Senate. It's got to go back to the House. I think the House comes back into session June 4th and they pass it out. They don't need to go to the governor to refer anything to the ballot. And this is their way of bypassing the governor altogether because she would veto this. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you think, uh, I want to get your take on the effect on the electorate come November. Is this going to be the big, uh, you know, election voting bonanza that Republicans want it to be? That's what they hope. I mean, in pure political terms, poll after poll shows that 70 percent of the Arizona GOP Illegal immigration and border security is their num number one issue. Um, I also believe that Republicans want to counteract the um, access to abortion uh, constitutional amendment that will be probably on the November ballot. They want to get their um, voters out. Um, but as we've seen with Texas and SB4, mm -hmm. we don't know if this is legal. Um, I think you yeah, had the head of the chamber, Arizona Chamber of Commerce on. My biggest concerns are who's going to pay for this? How do you do all the unfunded mandates? And mm -hmm. is this the right way to go? This is a federal issue, not a state issue, as you know. Yeah. And I want to hit the attorney up one more time on this. Um, do you think this, as a Democrat, as an attorney, do you think this is going to be challenged on the single subject rule? It probably will be, um, and then it's going to be challenged on other constitutional grounds, just like the Texas law is being challenged. And of course, the bill has some provision in it that says that it won't go into effect unless there's a decision on the Texas uh, mm -hmm. matter. But I think politically speaking, it is you know unfortunate because I think it does tarnish, as Mr. Seiden said earlier, the reputation of Arizona. It could lead to racial profiling, and I hope that voters vote against it. All right, thanks for joining us here today. But that is all the time we have. Be sure to join us next week for more Politics Unplugged. Good night.